We're looking at uh, joyful self-denial in, as we look at this chapter. Have you heard of the famous couple Jackie and Shadow? Uh, they live up in the Pine Gen- Raise your hand if you've heard of Jackie and Shadow. I want to say, oh my gosh, that's pretty great. Yeah. And so uh, even in my uh, gym, they got like 12 uh, uh, TV screens up there. And one of them is on the live cam of these two bald eagles. And they have three eggs in their nest. And uh, what well, sounds like most all of you know. But during Hatch Watch, when they, uh, when they were hatching these eggs, there's uh, three of them. But they said uh, 20,000 viewers were watching watching live and uh, this YouTube uh, live stream. But the reason I bring them up is uh, the bald eagle parents have braved wind and rain, and as you see in the picture, snow to protect these three precious eggs. At one point, Jackie, the mom, stayed atop the eggs without a break for just under 62 hours. 62 hours. Uh, Of course, one of the recent ones was uh, uh, her husband, if you will, uh, came and, and, and delivered on her nest as she was sitting on the eggs there, a big old giant fish, and just laid it down right next to her there. And, and so people are, in, you know, incredibly just watching this. Uh, but I think they can teach us a lot about joyful self-denial. And that's what Paul's going to hit on, especially towards the end of our message this morning, of why would I lay down my rights? Why would I deny what is rightfully mine? Why would there be any self-denial in my life? Why would I do that? And so he hits on that, that it's this joyful expression. But, but how does he find that joy? That's, where, that's what we're going to, uh, to search after. Now, my big idea or my main idea is kind of a long one. And so it's probably not a, a, a succinct, but, but I believe what it's about. Our life should be marked by joyful self-denial in knowing when to defend our rights and when to lay down our rights. In regards to the gospel with unbelievers and in regards of our walk with other believers. And so I think it's one where you got to kind of read that through a few times maybe to be able to grab it. But it's definitely what he's hitting on in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Now, Paul is a master illustrator. Just in this chapter alone, we're going to take up to verse 18, so a little more than half of our chapter. But just in this chapter alone, 15 examples he's going to give us. He's going to liken Christian ministry to, and I'll just rip through them, a soldier, a wine grower, a shepherd, oxen, a farmer, Old Testament priest, preacher, steward, and the next week we'll hit on servant, a Jew, one under the law, those without the law, those that are weak, runners, and fighters. That's a lot, but an incredible illustrator in that and to be able to take, this is like, and then he just goes through and just keeps popping them off in that way. Really incredible the way he does that. Again, let's remember, maybe you're uh, kind of fresh or new this morning to uh, uh, Corinthians, just a couple sentences here. Paul, Pastor Paul had planted this church in Corinth. He had worked there as their pastor for the first uh, 18 months with no salary. Uh, Paul has planted the church, okay? So not, not an easy thing, especially back in that day. There was no such thing as church. And so with that, it's a new religion, if you will. And, and so with that, and then stepping into a completely different culture. And so just stepping out and, and doing this, he planted the church and then led all of them to, to Christ and then labored intensely over them for that year and a half. And you'd think that he'd receive thanks or, or respect or maybe a stipend, but nope, no thanks only disrespect by some. Not by all of them, but a lot of dis- disrespect. Uh, again, in chapters 8, 9, and 10, is the same theme of this Christian liberty. Kind of remind you from last week a little bit in chapter 8. Christian decision-making is filtered through love. So what we are allowed to do, what we have the freedoms to do, what we have liberties to do, again, they should be, excuse me, filtered through love. We had talked about love, knowledge, and our conscience. Love, Knowledge in our conscience is what we looked at in chapter 8. And ultimately that love is what builds up. Knowledge puffs up, but it's love that ends up building up the body of Christ. Now in chapter 9, Paul's going to illustrate how he has given up a right to take financial compensation for his ministry. And what he's asking them to do is something that he's not unwilling to do himself. It's what he did. And so our outline, we're going to break up our 18 verses into Paul defends his rights 
and then Paul lays down his rights. And so he's going to say, it's, it's, it's interesting because he takes the opposite view and defends all of these things. And at the end of it, he turns around and then lays it all down. So I just wanted to prove that I can, in fact, take a salary. And then, but I'm not going to do it at the end. That's kind of the theme. And that's, that's where he's going there. So the first one, Paul defends his rights, that first section in that, and broke that up into two different areas. First one is Paul's apostolic credentials. And so let's read in verse 1 through 3. He starts off with these rhetorical questions. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? He had, even though he gets saved after the resurrection on the road to Damascus, if you remember, in the book of Acts. Are not you my workmanship? So he's speaking to the saints there at Corinth. Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. And then he starts his defense, starting in verse 4, especially down through verse 12 there. There, was, there were those that were scratching their heads about, is he really an apostle? Because the other apostles, and he'll even name some of them coming up in a second, they, they all take a salary. They all, we, we pay all of our itinerant pastors that come through, and he's going he's gonna to say, yeah, that's, that's good, and, and that's, that's right, but just because I don't take a salary that that makes me less of an apostle like wait aren't you worth it like you don't feel that you're enough to be able to be paid for what you're doing you know whatever it is that's part of the discussion as there's writing the, they're writing these questions and some are and he, and he brings it up in a, a number of his epistles about that because they're trying to figure that out they they want to know that are you really an apostle and so he's having to defend that at different times and so he gives his defense, his apologia, his apology, his apologetic uh, for that. And that's the, the word that he uses there in verse 3. He's about to kick up with his, uh, his defense here. And so uh, for the next part, we're going to go ahead and read it on through and, and hear his defense that he's giving there. And then we'll kind of break that into little pieces too. Starting in verse 4, here's his defense. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Meaning that he comes into town and he's teaching and preaching and doing that. And somebody's going to have him over for dinner and to be able to feed him and take care of him and his, his group that's, that's with him. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife? As do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, that's Peter of course, or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Remember, he was a, a tent maker. And he did that. He chose to do that so he wouldn't have to take a salary from them. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the, the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake. Because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher uh, thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who are serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord speaking of Jesus here, the Lord commanded that those proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Okay, let's walk back a little bit now. Warren Wiersbe said this and put it behind me there. We, we do not have the right to give up our freedom for that was purchased by Christ. That's Galatians 5 verse 1. But we do have the freedom to give up our rights. We don't have the right to give up our freedom. We have the freedom though to give up our rights. What a great way to make this, what his, this, this section here so uh, succinct for us. And so they're, 
first their rights to hospitality, to be able to eat and drink, have somebody have them over and to be able to, uh, to be fed for that. Uh, important point, he actually argues their case all the way through verse 12 as we just read. Y- yes, you're right, you should support itinerant pastors. He's saying, I'm the anomaly. Okay, I'm the anomaly. I'm not coming against. He's not stating a case why they shouldn't do that. No, it's in so many different directions. And he he takes the time and lays all of those out. And so that somebody preaching the gospel and doing that, and again, they're usually itinerant, either rabbis going around, or in this case, pastors going around that were doing that. We would consider them missionaries today, going in different places. They have the right to hospitality. Secondly, in verse 5, their rights to, to travel with family. It's like Peter, and he names the rest of them. Sounds like Peter would bring his wife along, and they they could go with them on their travel schedule. And so with that, I can bring my family with me because we're going to be gone for a while. And and so with that, the apostles do that. I can travel with my family. That's fine. 6 through 14, their rights to financial support. Yet Paul and Barnabas pursued none of these. So all of these were their rights. There are their rights. And he, again, states the, the case. I'll go into a little deeper on that. But again, Paul and Barnabas and I, we're just, we're just choosing not to. That's all. And so with that, there's these, uh, these five things that we're going to pop up here. Um, again, it's just the same verses up above there. But we'll look at these five boxes at the bottom of the screen there. It's the, it's the practice of other apostles. Everyone else is doing it. And it's good, and it's right. I can choose not to. That's simply that. Now, you have to understand, back in that day, they had these wisdom teachers that would go around. And with their great uh, uh, rhetoric and oratory skills. And so with that, they would, they would basically, with a large group, they would drop some of their great pearls of wisdom. But then afterwards, they would find different wealthy people coming up and say, you know, for a few bucks, I can give you more about what I got here, you know. And so it's just like the next class will cost this much, you know. And so that's what they were doing. And so the wealthy you were, the more you can understand and get more of the philosophical teachings or teachings on religion or whatever it was. And that's why Paul's going to later on say with the gospel, that's why it's free. I want to make sure it looks free, feels free, everything. It's, it's, it's free. And, and so with that, he's, he's hitting on that. We're not, we're not like the, the wisdom teachers that come rolling through in that way. It's not going to cost you money to hear these things. And so with that, elevating the poor to be on the same level of the wealth. You don't have to buy this information. He wants to make that really clear. Secondly, in verse 7, it's the experience of everyday life. Real simple, think about it, a a soldier is paid for his services. Secondly, a wine grower eats from the grapes of his harvest, and a shepherd drinks from the milk of his flocks. Pretty simple. And then he takes it to the commands of Scripture. Let's take it to the Bible. What does the Old Testament say? What did Moses say in the law? He's going to back it up scripturally. And so the command, not to muzzle an ox, which is treading out the grain, Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, and brought up a few times in the New Testament. Basically, that oxen treading out on the threshing floor, breaking up the grain stalks for winnowing, is saying, don't, don't muzzle it, allow it to eat some of what it's working to do here. The simple concept that's there. And it's interesting, if you go back in contest, it's talking about humans, 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 and all of a sudden just this one verse pops up uh, about an oxen. Like all of a sudden God cares about the oxen, and he does, but not as much as humans in that way, right? And it goes on, human, 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 and keeps going. So it's this one verse that's kind of out random of all of a sudden we're talking about, you know, about the farm. You know, let's get back to it. No, it's not what he's doing. Now, granted, it, it stresses kindness and fairness to animals that, that help a person, uh, you know, to be able to make their, their daily bread. A domesticated animal is not to be overworked or deprived of food. Sure, there's the, the simple concept. It's a true concept that is using. It just doesn't end there. It doesn't stop there. That's not the, the main point of it. Paul reveals when he's writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18 to support his point that church leadership and elders should be paid and certain of them even double this is what he says let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor especially those who labor in preaching and teaching for the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain 
and the laborer deserves his wages. Those are the two scriptures that Paul, he lays down there. So I have a cute old story for you. There was these three, three small boys, and they were bragging about their, their fathers. And so the first one said, first boy says, my, my dad writes a few short lines on paper, calls it a poem, sends it away, and gets $100 for it. Second boy says, that's nothing. My dad puts dots on a paper and calls it a song, and he sends it away and gets $200 for it. And the third kid says, ah, that's nothing. My father writes a sermon on a sheet of paper, gets up in the pulpit and reads it, and takes four men to bring in the money. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of uh, abuse that has taken place in our, our verse 11 here where it says, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? And unfortunately, there's been a lot of pastors that have fleeced the flock in that way and, and taken advantage of their positions or just kind of made that the thing. And they'll find those few verses where we have a right and they make that the thing and, and make it all about that. And that's a shame and it shouldn't happen in that way. But uh, unfortunately, with, with anything in scripture, you can take a handful of scriptures and without taking all the context and taking the flip side of that or the balance of them and, and they can take it in, in being abused. And, and Paul wanted to make sure, I just want to make sure that we just stay away from that and, 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 and don't get that abuse in any ways. The, the next one he gives, it's the, it's the pattern of the Levites and the priests now, it didn't say Levites and priests in verse 13 there, but he says those employed in temple service, and that's the Levites, and then the priests, those serving at the altar is the, the phrase that's there. But again, if you're a, a priest and doing the sacrificing, it specifically is laid out in the law of what part of the animal, after it's barbecued there, uh, the, the burnt offerings and stuff, is what they can take, what they can bring home, what they have to eat there, uh, what utensils to eat it in. And I mean, it goes into a whole lot of detail on that. The point is they get some of the blessings from that. And so the Levites, you know, were to work full time down at the tabernacle and thus the tithes brought in were to take care of he and his family. And the last one is because Jesus said so. And that's down in verse 14 uh, where he specifically says the Lord. He says, in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. This comes out from the Lord where Jesus talks about this is the sending out of the 12 and then he receives them back, talks about their, their first engagement and going out and sharing the gospel. He does it next with the, the sending out of the, the 72 in Luke chapter 10 verse 7 in that context for the laborer deserves his wages. And so then he tells them, so don't go house to house looking for the better house or the better grub or the better food and the better this and the better that. Don't do that. Just wherever you go, just kind of land there. But but yes, they're, they're going to take care of you hospitally, you know, trust me in that, how they do that. And so it was, it was right. But then he shifts, and I'm going to back up to verse 12b. We read down to 14, but we're going to go out to the, the middle. And in most of your uh, Bibles, you'll, you'll probably see how uh, it, was, it wasn't a good verse break, if you will. Like in the middle of 12 kind of is, 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 is the next thought. And so I'll read it from uh, there. Paul lays down his rights to remove. So he stands up. Here's the rights that I have to be able to do that. But it's also my right to lay those rights down. And so starting again in 12b. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded the, that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. He gives up his rights so as to win souls. Obstacles to the gospel. That word obstacles it literally means something cut down and lying in a person's way. And so there, that, that can look like a, a lot of different things. Those obstacles might look like some of our Christian liberties might get in the way of us sharing the gospel. Where people are looking at us with kind of a, a wry eye and, and just like, mm, what are you doing? It could be sin in our life or uh, moral issues in our life. That's going to hinder the gospel. That's going to be an obstacle. Relational conflict within the church, the outside world looks at that, 
laughs at that, sees it in the news, sees it online, sees what's happening in the different churches and, 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 or, you know, or right here in our valley. Relational conflict within the church could be unforgiveness, could be anger. Here's a question for you this morning. How are you a tripping hazard to others? How are you an obstacle? What's going on in your life that might be an obstacle? And so we need to think about that. Maybe your unforgiveness, that definitely hinders the gospel. Maybe your anger might has altered the progress of the gospel for sure. I've let my anger get in the way. How about your desire for comfort? And we know that comfort isn't inherently bad, but what about when you've chosen comfort over gospel advance? How about your desire for security? Those kind of things. That's what we need to look at on what might be hindering the gospel from either going out, if, or A, not going out and sharing it, you know, that kind of thing. It's interesting, he used the word gospel in this chapter seven times. Seven times this comes up. Paul was defining a gospel that didn't match a particular culture or ethnicity, nor line up with any political ideology. That's fascinating because, think about this, how, how does the gospel break through preferences and cultures? It does it by not making those the main thing political ideologies. We become so consumed in that in the United States, but, but wait a minute, the gospel's to go to Germany and Russia and Nepal and Haiti and, and all over the world. And so, so with that, the more you travel and the more you see that, you're able to see, I, I guess, identify maybe a little bit back what, what matters, the weightier, the, the weightier things in that. That's what, that, that's what Paul's saying here. And so, the gospel given in that first century is the same gospel that works in every century, in every culture, male or female, Jew or Gentile, right? You know the, the list, slave or free, and it's, it's, it's up here gospel, and a lot of times we get down in the weeds and we're, we're focused, and this becomes our focus over here, and we make that the thing on who will fellowship and what we'll do, and, and it, gets, it gets crazy really fast. Think about this also. How does, it, how does the gospel knit people of so many differences together? So different. Working with my friends over in, in Nepal, my, my, our, our friend Jai, he's, uh, you know, with, with a Hindu upbringing and living in a Hindu culture and all of those different things, we're, we're different in that sense. He is a born-again believer. I'm a born-again believer. But there's, there's, there's a lot of different customs and cultural things and things that I'm, of course, still learning in that. But, but with that, it's just it's fascinating how you can pop over to the, the other side of the world and meet somebody and love them like a brother that you haven't known that long. But there's, there's this, this continuity, there's this, this beauty. We have Jesus at the center of our relationship, right? And that's what it goes. And so he's different. I do things different. He does church different. I do church different. And, and, but with it, it, it just doesn't matter. It's Christ is our focal point. Talking about the, the gospel, Timothy Keller gives a, just an incredible quote. The operating principle of religion, this is religion versus gospel, okay? The, the principle, operating principle of religion is I obey, therefore I am accepted by God. Whereas the operating principle of the gospel is I'm accepted by God, therefore I obey. It's a very profound, succinct, beautiful way of drawing that contrast, drawing the difference of what we're saying about the good news of the gospel it's not something that you've done or could do or could do better. No, it's what Christ has done for you. And we have to remind ourselves of that, especially as he brings it up seven times. He wants it to grab our attention with that. I wanted to make mention. He uses the gospel seven times. He uses the word right, my rights, giving up my rights, laying down my rights seven times also. And so the gospel seven times, right uh, uh, seven times, and something else popped up. Uh, we'll look at reward, I think, three times, um, a couple more. Paul lays down his rights for a greater joy. 
he starts kind of wrapping up this section in 15 through 8. Now he, he takes it to the end of the chapter for sure, but we're going to stop at verse 18. But this, this last section of 15 through 18 here, he really gets to the, the nitty gritty of what's going on and how we can connect in with this. He says, but I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these sayings to secure any such provision. Like you might think that his speech is going on of this is what I expect now. Not, not doing that either. For he says, listen to this, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. Then he says, what then is my reward? What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Well, we have a lot here. Really, this boasting is different than how we normally think boasting. It's Paul's ready to boast about something. But there's a difference of boasting about yourself and boasting about someone else. That's what's happening here. He's not, let me boast. Let me tell you how awesome I am. It's not where he's going. It's not what he says. It's not to glory in himself, but he's going to boast in Christ. It's this ecstatic rejoicing over Christ and what he does. It's kind of like he's saying, do you you know how worthy Christ is? I'll pay my own way to do his work. That's how much I love him. That's how much I care for him. I'm going to work my tail off to be able to present his, go out and present his gospel. That's how incredible he is. It's really this exclamation of Paul's life. Is, can you believe how good Jesus is and how good he's been to me? So to lay down my salary is nothing at all. But Paul, how do you do it? Well, it's that joyful self-denial. That's how Paul did it and that's how we're able to do it also. Joyful self-denial. He brings up the word steward or stewardship in verse 17. One who is given much to oversee but owns nothing himself. Just like Joseph back in the book of Genesis there. That he says, but as a steward, this is what you do. Don't own anything. It's all his. Verse 18, Paul asks and answers, what then is my reward? Well, preaching the gospel was reward enough. Paul's not talking about eternal rewards here. So usually you and I, we, we hear rewards and it's something we're going to get in the heavenly someday. That's not what he's talking about. It's, it's the reward that he receives in the laying down of his rights. How do I do this self-denial? Well, my blessing is... <laughs> excuse me, my, this, this rejoicing, my, my reward is I get to do that. I can lay down my rights. I just want to make sure it's free of charge. Do you know why that, that's the main reason we don't pass a plate and never have since this became a Calvary back in 1985? Pastor Bob before me, and when I took over in 1989, we just kind of kept it going. God's always provided for us. We just stuck bo- boxes in the back because... On a Sunday morning, never wanted people to feel that, oh, here's here's, here's a basket stuck in front of me that that some people are going to give out of obligation. You know, they just feel obliged to do that even if they don't come here, even if they're not an unbeliever. And it just felt that way. Am I against churches that do that? Absolutely not. People have traditions where they've done it, and, um, and actually more money comes in by doing that, of reminding people, oh, yeah, yeah, I should do it, you know, right? But we just said, no, we'll, we'll trust God to be able to provide for us. We don't want new family members, new friends, new people coming in feeling like that's the thing. We firmly believe that, because it's all over Scripture, that, that once they become a believer, that they know that there's an aspect of their finances. They know to be, that God would want them to be a, a, a cheerful, generous giver, and they have, we have a place for that in, in the back, and they can put that in there, and it's between them and the Lord, and not your neighbor looking at you going, hey, oh, it's a 20, huh? <laughs> Whatever. Just different ways of doing it. It's not right and wrong. It's just, it's just our... 
It's just our heritage. It's, it's just it's what happened when I got saved at Calvary in Bellflower. Pastor Gary did it there. It's, it's all I've known, really, since, since getting saved. It's all I've seen, and somehow God always provides, and we thank him for it. And you should thank him for it as a church also, because he's always blessed us in that way. Do you want to boast or tend to boast about your sacrifices? See, see again, his boasting was in God. But there's, there's times where we, but, but God, I did this, and I didn't get this. And we, we try this thing with God that we're like, we're going to out-manipulate him or something that, that if I give this amount of money, if I give up this thing over here, then we can't manipulate God that way. That's not the way it works. What have we given up for Christ? And maybe you've, you've walked that through in your mind. Maybe you've shared it with your spouse. Maybe you've, you know, it's just like, wow, look what I've done. I've, I've heard it multiple times. I've heard it at memorial services. Look at all they did for God. And then God takes his life, takes them home. <laughs> yeah, that's what he's trying to do for all of us. That's his ultimate goal. He wants to get us all home. Read, go back and read John 17 and in verse 23, 24, right in that area. He says that's exactly what he's doing because he can't wait to be with you and live with you all of his life and to reveal his glory to you. That's what it's all about. And so it's not ticked off at somebody when he takes a, a believer home, but they're a good Christian. Uh, I know, you know, but they're a beautiful believer. They were doing this. They were doing so much for the kingdom. I know. He loves them. He loves them incredibly. He's not ticked off at them. He wants him to be with himself. Can you blame him for that? All of our boasts should be in what Jesus has done and how he sacrificed for us. But Peter was thinking about it, and in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27, I'll put it on the right side of the screen there, Peter was thinking about what he's given up for the Lord. And uh, we're very thankful for Peter's questions. But it says, then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? <laughs> do, we, do we understand what he's asking for right there? <laughs> Grease the palm. What, what, what are you going to give me? What do we get? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you will, you, excuse me, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is right after, in Matthew there, right after the, the teaching of the rich young ruler who couldn't walk away from his stuff. This right after that was the, it's easier for, a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So Peter, is, he's quick. He's quick on his feet. Okay, so if it's not about rich people, we're poor. Hey, we're poor. What up? We get to go in? We, we good? We, we did what the rich young ruler wouldn't do. We gave it up to follow you. I gave up my sport fishing and glass bottom boat business for you. What do I get? That's the, that's the question. And it's definitely a kind of commercialized view of Christianity, but it's interesting. The way Christ answers it is he overlooks all of that. You'd think it was a time where he would just like, ooh, Peter, slow down. Don't, you know, you can think it. Don't say it. Yeah. But we're glad that he just jumps out there and does it so we can have the, the response to that. He just overlooks any self-congratulations here and simply points to his own faithfulness. Oh, I will be faithful to reward you coming up. We see that Peter changes in the book of Acts where he later says, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give unto you. And we, we see this shift to what do I get to what can I give, right? We, we see that, that, that shift that takes place early on in that book of Acts. Any sacrifice will be more than repaid which seems to make any and every sacrifice really only a temporary sacrifice. Anything you give up, anything I give up, a, a penny, whatever it is, our time, whatever that is, if we get paid back, not only in this time, lifetime, but in, in the time to come, somehow, some way, that's what he says he does. I, I, I like using the, the, uh, the illustration, Terry, if I said, hey, Terry, 
uh, would you give me 10 bucks? He'd reach in his pocket, and if you have cash, most of us don't carry cash. Do you have 20? <laughs> no. <laughs> Terry would give me 10 bucks. But if I turned around and a few minutes later, I, I give him 100 bucks back, and then before we leave at the end of service, I give him 1,000 bucks back, then is your 10 bucks really a sacrifice? Like, I'm willing to give Brian 10 bucks right in that way, right? If I turn around and give you 100 and I turn around and give you 1,000, what's, what's up with the 10 bucks? And that's how everything that we do, everything that we lay down, everything, every right that we lay down. And if I can get the 10 bucks later, I'd really take it. We'll get Starbucks together. But with that, right, we need to, I, I think that's what, how Paul's envisioned this, this, this giving and the sacrificial lights and, and laying things down and just not worrying about it. No, actually, that 10 bucks is a great investment is what it becomes, right? That becomes a great investment. Sure, Brian, anytime Brian asks for a 10, if I'm going to get, uh, you know, 1,100 bucks back, yeah. That's what he promises us. Earthly increases promised, heavenly blessings assured. Absolutely. The disciples left all. Now, you and I, according to our standards today, would say, well, did they really leave much? <laughs> it was not much, but it was all to them for sure. Remember, God's storehouses includes the widow might, widow's might. So the one who gives himself completely to, to Christ's lock, stock and barrel, finds hundreds, hundreds of homes open to him, innumerable brothers and sisters and moms and dads in the Lord, spiritual children, you know, converts of the faith. When you follow Christ, you simply can't lose. And the general public will always see the rich young ruler as, as, as first, and the poor disciples as last. And that's where he ends that section there with, now the last will be first and the first will be last. I'm going to conclude it there because we still have communion and I'm going to invite out our worship team. But Savior, we want to say how precious, how good, how worthy you are. All glory and honor and praise belong to you. God, that we would just continue to esteem you in our minds and our hearts and our souls and to be able to say, God, you're so good. And that any sacrifice, anything that I lay down, anything that I say no to in this life, you talk about all the, the payback, but again, even in that, it shouldn't be for that. It's simply because you are worthy. And so, Lord, we, we remind you of that. We want to say that to you this morning. We remind ourselves of that. And so, Lord, we uh, thank you for this example of our friend Paul, what we learn from him and learn from his life. We find ourselves challenged to do the same in certain areas of our life. And so, Lord, pray, place your finger upon those different areas. We're all different. We're all the different stages of our lives and our Christianity. So, Lord, take your finger upon each of our hearts and reveal those to us where you would have us to kind of take a step back and to be able to give or give up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.